from our JBS studios in Midtown, New York. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to JBS's live election night analysis of Israel 2019 Israeli elections. Israeli polls closed at 10 p.m. Israel time, which is roughly 3 p.m. New York time. The results will not be final, most probably, until sometime tomorrow. Very similar to our own U.S. closely contested elections where the final tally may take days or even weeks to verify. But we do have a very good sense of the likely outcome. And to help us analyze what these Israeli elections mean, I'm so pleased to be joined by a wonderful panel of commentators who will be helping us make sense of it all. As always, we're joined by the director of the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, novelist and writer and commentator, who now serves as legal analyst for CBS Radio, Thane Rosenbaum, whom you can also see moderating his annual series of discussions at the 92nd Street Y. We're also joined by one of American Jewry's foremost leaders, a former chairman of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations, Richard Stone, who also made a major contribution to world Jewry as chairman of the National Conference on Soviet Jewry. I'm pleased to welcome to JBS for the first time Rabbi Josh Weinberg, who serves as both the vice president of the URJ for Israel and Reform Judaism, as well as serving as executive director of ARTSA, the reform movement's arm in Israel. And it's wonderful to be joined by one of the leading journalists writing about Israel today, Danielle Ziri, a Sabra with a master's degree in journalism from Colombia, who currently serves as the New York correspondent for the daily Israeli newspaper and website Haaretz and for Khan Israeli public television. I thank all of you for making the journey down to our JBS studios. Thank you all for joining us, each and every one of you. I'm looking forward so much to hearing what you have to say. By the way, we may be joined during the program by a guest or two on our JBS phones. And we hope that some of you may call with some thoughts of your own. And we have a new toll-free number for you. If you're used to dialing phone numbers by name, it's very easy to remember, 833-MY-JBS-TV, 833-MY-JBS-TV. The number is 833-695-2788. But first, let me summarize the results of today's elections that we know thus far. And in some way, it was no surprise, and in some way, there were some surprises. And I'm anxious to hear what our guests have to say. But first, you should know that initially, both Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu each declared they had won. Blue and White said it had won. Likud said it, it had won. And he, to some extent, it's true. This was a very tight election. I'm going to be interested to hear whether our panel expected as close a, an election between the two major parties. There were 39 parties running in this year's election. Now, you have to get 3.25% of the vote to be counted as a party that gets a seat in the Israeli Knesset. Many, many, many of the parties that ran did not get near 3.25%. They're not anywhere in the upcoming Israeli cabinet, the Israeli, I should say, Knesset parliament. But there were two major parties. For all the noise, for all of the various parties, there were only two that garnered any real number of, of seats and percentage in the vote tally. By the way, I hope you all know Israel has a parliament. It's called the Knesset. It has 120 seats. To be the governing party, you must put together a coalition of a majority of those seats, 61 or more seats. No party has ever won more than 60 seats on, it own, on its own. Since Israel's founding, there has always been a coalition government. So the question is, would blue and white be the party to finally unseat Benjamin Netanyahu's right-leaning 
coalition, or would Benjamin Netanyahu win a fifth term as prime minister, 10 years serving as Israel's prime minister, he would be the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. Would he be able to get enough Likud seats and other coalition seats so that he would have a 61 seat coalition? I want to put up for you the numbers. I want our panel to also see it. Here are all of the numbers of the parties that did qualify for this term's Israeli Knesset. The top two, only the top two, had any major percentage or seats. Blue and white, according to this poll, has 37 seats. Likud has 36. We should explain that there are many television channels putting out their own percentages of exit polls. Channel 12 has its numbers. Channel 13 has its numbers. Khan, the Israel public uh, television in Israel, has its numbers. We've chosen to use Khan's. It may be that as the night progresses or in the morning, there will be different numbers up on the screen. But the numbers you see now are the numbers reported by Khan. They give blue and white 37 seats, Likud 36. So in a head-to-head -head contest, lo and behold, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid's party, Blue and White, a new party on the Israeli scene, did come out with the most seats and the highest percentage by a razor's margin. On the left-leaning parties, Labor, which once was the party in Israel, Labor was able to garner eight seats. Meretz, the far-left-leaning party in the state of Israel, gained five seats, has five seats, Kulanu, Kotlin, Kotlin's party, gained five seats. And you see there that those seats total 55 seats. So even though Blue and White had 37, more than any other party, the coalition that they would likely lead with the other left-leaning seats only comes to 55 under the threshold of 60 or 61. Likud, on the other hand, had 36 seats. But there were five, four other parties which would most likely join a right-leaning coalition. United Torah had seven, Shash had seven, Shas and United Torah being the ultra-Orthodox parties. Israel Beitenu had four seats, and Union of Orthodox, I think, Union of, is that right? Of right-wing parties, Union of right-wing parties, which was a controversial party, we don't, we'll discuss that later on, of Jewish home and Otsma Yehudit, they won five seats. If those four parties joined a right-wing coalition, Likud and Benjamin Netanyahu would have 59 seats. So lo and behold, at the moment, neither party, if these were the final tallies, neither party, neither Blue and White nor Likud, would have enough seats to, to have a coalition government. What would happen in that situation? First of all, there are Arab parties. The Arab parties have another um, six seats. The question is, is it at all probable that the Arabs would join a left-leaning coalition? Most Israelis don't think that's likely. That means, again, the numbers show it's hard for either Benjamin Netanyahu or Benny Gantz, Yair Lapid, to gain a coalition number. And if there's no coalition, two things might happen. There could be a unity government. Every now and then, Israel has had a unity government where the top two parties decide to work together. I'll be interested to hear what all four of you have to say about the likelihood of a unity party in which Benjamin Netanyahu and Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid work together. Benny Gantz has said he will, in, he will never work in a, a, a unity government with Benjamin Netanyahu, though recently there seems to be cracks in that never. But that's one option, that we have a unity government. And the other option is nobody can form a coalition government, and Reuven Rivlin, the president of Israel, will order another election. And so right on the heels of this 
election on April 9th, we will have another Israeli election. That, in general, is a summary of where we are as the five of us sit with you tonight to analyze the results. And I begin with you, as I always do, Thane. As you look at the election and you hear the summary, what's your sense of what tonight's elections mean? How do you react to them? Um, in some ways, they're surprising, but in some ways, not. Um, one thing I would say, although it would sound contradictory, that both Blue and White and Likud both underachieved. Interesting. Both underachieved, underperformed. Tell uh, us why. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, Netanyahu uh, is presiding over a booming Israeli economy. He has embassies moving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. He has sovereignty over a Golan. He has a relationship with the President of the United States and the President of Russia that no Israeli Prime Minister has ever imagined. And he's one seat behind a novice who has never run for public office, who has no concept, and he probably, Gans probably doesn't even know where the bathroom is in the Knesset. I mean, he really has no ministerial roles before. He's never managed an economy. What he has is a, a, a tremendous military pedigree, and he's six foot five, which means that he could probably play on the Israeli national basketball team. But how, how is it possible that Gantz actually would out, uh, uh, vote him, out uh, electioneer him by one vote? On the other hand, uh, there are many people who thought that it was time for Bibi to go. Of course. He had overstayed his welcome, and he's facing an indictment uh, on corruption and bribery and breach of trust. Uh, and that's going to come up immediately. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, he loses, to some degree, his uh, credibility as the man who can defend this homeland because blue and white, it's not just Gantz. It also includes two other former military Correct. chiefs of staff. So it, in this instance, only in Israel is it possible for a prime minister who was never the I, uh, head of uh, uh, idea. Although he has a very impressive, distinguish. very impressive. No, and clearly, you know, Netanyahu is the statesman. He's proven it over and over again. So in some ways, there were lost opportunities for both sides. Okay. We are going to come now back later to what you think the implications are. But Richard, just your reaction to what you see here. Well, I want to say two things, Mark. First, uh, you said earlier that we're in the same situation that we're in in a close election in America when Everybody's claiming victory, but we really don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's important to remember this is actually quite different because this election is only the start. Whoever is ahead numerically at the end of tonight, there are two processes that go on. One is the process in the head of President uh, Rivlin, who, and I don't know what exactly, uh, what calculations he would take into account. It, he must take personal opinions into account as well as what the margin is. But I think he's supposed to also imagine who will build a, a coalition in the most uh, stable fashion. And then once he's decided who should get the first shot, there's then the negotiations over the coalition. So we're at a much more preliminary stage than we are other than Bush v. Gore. We're in a very preliminary stage here. Although that is the way every election works yeah. in Israel, yeah. even if it's not yes, close. Yes, absolutely. Okay. As to being whether, what my reaction in general is, I want to take some issue with Dane. I, I agreed mostly with what he said, but I'm not sure that Bibi really underperformed because the fact is that the, in a democracy, to have been in office so long is, it's not Franklin Roosevelt during the Second World War following the Depression. To be in office for as long as Bibi has tends to make people in a democracy tired of you and want change almost no matter how well you're doing. Uh, second, it's, if he had a platform that was so markedly different from any of the others so that the election would be decided on uh, issues rather than on perceptions of personality and competence, then I would be more inclined to say that. But the fact of the matter is I went through this afternoon in order to confirm my thoughts, all the platforms. Mm -hmm on the important issues of security and the really important issue of how to negotiate with the Palestinians and what in the peace process, uh, you can't find a difference, including with labor. Uh, each party is trying to show that it's as security conscious and even more so than the other. And when you add it all up, it's so close to the same that I think that 
it's remarkable that the level of conf confidence in Bibi's ability brought him to where he is in this in these numbers Very right now. Very interesting. Okay. Josh, anything to surprise you? What was your reaction here? Yeah, well, first of all, good evening, and thank you for having me. It's an honor it's to be with, uh, having you, with these uh, esteemed uh, panelists. Um, I think there's a, there's a few fascinating things. Well, first of all, let's see that this may be a case of um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that if you, f if you rewind 10 years ago to this exact moment in 2009, we were seeing a very similar case in which Sippy Livni actually got uh, ousted Likud and got more votes and more mandates there. But then, um, after a calculation, the president then turned to Netanyahu to be able to form the coalition. And that's because um, it looked like Sippy Livni could she not wouldn't put be able, together yeah, yeah. a coalition it, of more it, than 61 it, seats. Exactly, exactly. And just as she had uh, given her victory speech, uh, she realized, as both Gantz and Netanyahu have now given their victory speeches. I think a few so other the, things are... Well, I want you to continue. But I find what you said so to the point and interesting. And you've had experience here. Sippy Livni didn't realize this? Sippy Livni didn't figure out that even though she had more seats than Netanyahu, there was no way she was going to put together a coalition government. I, I think you, you said earlier, commented, that both had claimed victory. Correct. I'm, I've never been sure in an American election why candidates claim victory after the polls are closed because there's no one they can influence. The, the poll counters are not going to be influenced by Correct. your confident right. claim of victory. Right. Right. But in this situation where there's still a president of the country to pick a coalition former and there are coalition partners, I think that the uh, correct thing to do for a smart politician is to be very, very confident and say, I'm winning and claim victory. Yes, that but why would somebody claim victory when they can count to 61? You want to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. well, we have to understand how the, the rules of the game are from, from now on. Uh, what's going on is that the responsibility to, um, to give the responsibility to somebody to create a coalition that's on the president of Israel. Going to have to do now is going to not only look at those numbers and have to listen to what the people want, but also each uh, one of these parties that we're seeing on our board are going to have to recommend for him someone to uh, give the responsibility of the coalition. I apologize to you. Yeah. I'm going to come back to you in one minute. We're going to fix your microphone. Okay. Okay. I interrupted you. No, no, it's okay. It's, um, I think it, as interesting as to see who made it in, and I might just say that. You know, as we look at the numbers here, I'm not sure where Kulana would fit on the right, left, and just as uh, are you saying, Kulana, I think Kulana might go might on, the be on the right. No, I think they might yeah. be on the right. right. As on the right, different, really different than what they're listed here. Yeah, they they ran on a platform that was called in Hebrew Hayamin Hashafui, the sane right, and uh, as as Moshe Kachlon, the head of the party, and now and the current finance minister was walking out of the uh, press conference. He said, I "I'm in the nationalist camp," which means that he'll join the Netanyahu coalition. What I think is as fascinating as who made it in and who got, also interesting to know who did not make it in. Um, notably, first of all, on the right, notably that the, what's called the new right, Ayamina Khadash, uh, Naftali Bennett and his number two, Ayelet Shaked, are looking like they are not going to make it. It's, Isn't that amazing? It's a, it's, amazing. It, it's a big story. This is he Naftali took a major Bennett. Risk. Naftali Bennett has been a minister in the government since 2013. Took uh, had a two minister, three minister port portfolios actually. Um, important he, portfolios. Important portfolios. Yeah, absolutely. He at one point was a rising mm -hmm. star. I, I think he would see himself still as a rising star, even though uh, he may not make it in, may find himself in the unemployment line next week. But um, what I think is interesting to see what factions have split, um, who's grown and who's shrunk. Considerably, of course, the noticeable story on the left uh, has gone from Labor, who was at 24 seats with the Zionist Union, and now is going to be around seven or eight, depending on uh, on how all the chips fall in the end. That's a massive, massive decrease uh, of votes. Merritt has maintained their seat at about five, which is which is also interesting, um, in that a lot of people were making a calculated vote. I want to point out that I think that this elections, sadly, in my opinion, was noticeably bereft of ideology. 
and yeah. it was bereft of you know you, you mentioned their you mentioned their platforms recently. People were voting on a specific calculation of who would be able to attain leadership and who would be able to form a coalition in the end of the day. Now, I think there are a couple of other interesting uh, things that are going to happen. What we're looking at is, regardless of what the actual you know, number of seats come in, we're looking at a very, very narrow coalition. Okay? We had this in 2015 where it started at 61 and then grew to 67. We had it back in the days of Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres in 1992 where Rabin passed the Oslo Agreements with, with a 61 uh, Knesset member ma mandate majority, right? including the Arab parties, and a very, very slim, uh, you know, s slim margin of, of, uh, of rule or, or of a, a majority. And that gives a tremendous amount of power to the smaller parties. And we'll get back to that when we talk about the implications for uh, you know, diaspora Jewry. But I think that's, that's it's a really important piece to say whether Netanyahu was successful or not. Yes, he was successful. And he, it, this, I think, in many ways was a referendum. Mm -hmm. on, you know, as someone else said, this was all about the Benjamins, you know, <laughs> both, both you know, Benjamin Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, and it was really a referendum on his leadership, and, and you know, roughly half the country. That's beautifully said, went for Josh. Him. How did Netanyahu do, in your opinion? Look, I think he did well, and it's I, I, you know, I'm not a prophet nor a son of a prophet, but I think that he will, in the end, get tapped by okay. the. Okay. By the way, Likud had 30 seats in the last Knesset. Right. If he yeah. ends up with 36, and I'm not sure that number yeah. will end up at 36, he would have increased his number of seats. That's interesting to me. You were making a very interesting point. Would you come back to it? Yes, absolutely. So we were talking about, you know, why declare victory uh, before there's even a coalition, before you're even chosen to... to um, why would to you declare victory if you can count the because, 61? Because there's a number here of uh, steps that are going to be taken in the next yeah. few days that are part of a convincing game. Uh, because all these parties are going to have to call up the president of Israel, Ruben Rivlin, and recommend to him who they see fit to form the coalition. Those big parties that we're seeing on the board, Likud and Blue and White, are going to have to convince those parties to recommend them to Ruben Rivlin. So that means um, that they have to show a front as the winner. They have to show a very confident front okay. to those parties. Danielle, I have trouble with what you're saying only because I don't, you know more than I do. By the way, you're the only <laughs> Israeli on our mm -hmm. panel. I'm also. Are you Israeli? Oh, you I'll, were I'll born in the, America, um, though. I was born in America. I made Aliyah. And you made Aliyah, and you, ha you are an Israeli citizen, citizen. But I didn't go back to vote. It's OK. Yeah. But wait, <laughs> did you serve in the IDF? I did. Yes. And, but she's the only sovereign. Oh, she's the only <laughs> OK. Um, when you say, there's not a question that Rivlin is going to either ask Blue and White or Likud to form the government. No. No matter who calls him. This is obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Listen, That's not where the interesting thing lies. The, the, the interesting thing here is the, wherever you have the, the results in Israel, like we said, we talked about Tzibi Livni uh, a few years ago, it's really not about the results. It's about your ability to, uh, to ally with other people, yes. with, other, um, with other parties. Right now, Likud has a better chance of doing that because um, unlike what we see here, I would put Kulanu in the red column. Um, Netanyahu has you. made very clear uh, from the beginning that he would form a coalition with the natural, uh, his natural yeah. allies. Meaning which makes sense. Which makes well, sense, well, okay. which also means that it doesn't reflect the change that we clearly see that Israelis do want. Otherwise, blue and white wouldn't have made it that far and wouldn't have come to 37 seats, according to this poll. Okay. Although, overall, there are left-leaning parties and there are right-leaning parties. Absolutely. And what you're saying is we have misplaced one of the parties. It would mean that blue oh. and white had 50, not 55. Absolutely. And... And, and, why do, and, and one of the things, and I'd love to hear all four of you talk about this, one of the things that seems to bother many American Jews is what they consider to be a right-leaning government mm -hmm. leading the state of Israel. And many of them just hate Benjamin Netanyahu almost as much as they hate Donald Trump. And not only that, it was as if 
from an American Jewish perspective, the fact that Donald Trump and Netanyahu were so close was a negative. It worked against American Absolutely. Jews liking Netanyahu. My own, and I'm, I've said this many times, the two of you are Israelis. We are not Israelis. We see this from afar. It always sort of bemuses me that American Jews hate a prime minister of Israel. If he's elected in a duly democratic election in the state of Israel, it means that the Israeli people, by and large, lean more towards his perspective than they do to Benny Gantz's or, the, or Yair Lapid's or, ben, or some of the other people who've come and gone. Herzog is gone. You mentioned those. Herzog is gone. Ayelet Shaked is gone. It's a, Moshe Feiglin on the right is gone. How did that happen? Yeah. You know, one. and you heard all <laughs> kinds of predictions ahead of that. But my, my, so my point is... All his voters are showing up tomorrow to vote. Oh, is that it? Yeah. By the way, there was a very <laughs> low turnout. Yes. That's right. Which means, and you said this before, some of you said it was not ID. There, was, there wasn't there was mamach no there. There wasn't no. substance there. Mm -hmm. And we haven't seen substance in many elections in many countries. So it's, it's not surprising. But your point is very well taken at the same time time, it seems to me, that it's not fair to the Israeli electorate not to say, by and large, they still lean to the right. And from their oh. perspective, it's not even right. Oh, it's clear. They're, from and their I, perspective, and I don't even it's think, centrist. you know, I mean, um, Netanyahu has liked during this campaign to label kind of blue and white as leftist, which has become almost a curse word in, in, in Israel, right? Um, but Benny Gantz really is not left. He's the old right. <laughs> Um, so, you know, the fact that Likud has gone more to the right and more to the right over the years doesn't necessarily mean um, that blue and white is left. And in addition to that, if you notice, in a lot of the speeches that he gave, he was talking against Lapid. Lapid was the problem for him in the blue and white yeah, party. Absolutely. Gantz was not really a criticism factor. It was really more uh, Lapid who represents the left for him. Another thing that I wanted to, sorry to cut you off, to mention. Um, I don't think we mi misplaced Kulanu, but I would put it still on the scale, on the balance in the middle, because just um, when the results were announced or the polls were announced, um, Kulanu, Moshe Kahlon, the head of Kulanu, has said that he's not sure who he's giving his, um, you know, who he's going to sit at the coalition with. We, we thought at, in Israeli television, Israeli media, that it was going to go to Likud automatically. No, not so sure. So I think it, putting him somewhere Thank in the middle you. would be interesting. Fabulous. Yeah. You were going to say. Yeah, I, I think that Gantz is not to the left, and I don't think Bibi is seriously to the right. Mm -hmm. And if you read their platforms on the key security issues, they are picking at each other to, dis to discover uh, discrepancies and, and differences. In other words, they have to work to find you differences. have to work at it. Uh, I mean, that was even true of uh, Bougie Herzog. I, I remember the last time he was running against BB, asking him both in public and privately, tell me what the difference is between you. What would you do differently on the key security issues? And he said, well, I, I would do it with a different attitude and a different style. And he couldn't, literally couldn't say anything otherwise about it. But the, you said the Israeli, there's a perception in America that the Israeli electorate has moved to the right. I, I interpret that very, there is such a perception, but I think it's ridiculous. What's happened over the last 20 years or so in Israel is that I think the Israelis from left to right have been disillusioned about the possibility of making the deal that I believe that virtually everybody in this race would like to make to end the conflict with the Palestinians permanently. This is what I think that everybody kind of knows what deal they would like to make, but each year is increasingly despairing, but for maybe a little hope coming from the Gulf alliances and so on and some of the, uh, some of the activity, diplomatic activity. But no one wants to make a deal that isn't secure, mm -hmm. and I think everybody kind of wants to make, it, make a deal that is secure. The fact that there's not much conversation it, within Israel, other than from what's now pretty much the far left that criticizes the brutality of the Israeli occupation, less and less of that is perceived in America as a turn to the right. 
I don't think it is. It's okay. just a. I want, I want to ask you yeah. a, to comment on Ms. Trump, with Netanyahu being in one minute. But I want to ask you as, in, as a Sabra. I know you're Israeli, but. I'm glad I'm representing ask, here. Uh, yeah. You are. Uh, you are. She has a tiny sound. I want to tell you what Israelis <laughs> tell me on JBS mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. They say something like this. They say it very sweetly. We understand that in America, the big issue as it applies to Israel for you is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm -hmm. For Israelis, it's down at the bottom. There are so many issues we care about. But that issue at the moment, as you've said, uh, Israelis by and large all agree. If there were a pe an interlocutor on the other side, this would be solved in a week. But Israelis don't see it, and they've moved on. And that in this election, while you might talk about security, how do you handle Hamas? What do you do about Gaza? It's not peace with the Palestinians that drives Israeli concern. As a Sabra, I'm asking you, to what extent do you feel that's a fair analysis? I think that's a fair analysis. I think that uh, the Israeli public is perceiving today that we're at sort of a roadblock in terms of the Palestinian uh, issue. And that's why it's kind of not in their priorities now, because they don't think that there's a partner on the other side. At least that's the, the narrative, right, from years of this, uh, of this prime minister and this kind of government, right-wing government, that the partner is just not there, and therefore we can't do anything about it. That's so the Israeli understanding. That's the Israeli understanding. And therefore, they're making their decisions based on something else. Yes. However, I did speak with a lot of voters, uh, and uh, namely voters who... Uh, live here, Israelis who live here have decided to fly over to Israel because you know we don't have absentee ballots, so they have to fly over to vote. Um, and a lot of them have told me that this is one of their main issue. Another thing I wanted to point out as to your point between the Jewish community and Israel kind of disparity. I think the Jewish community here, and having covered this for a while, I can tell you that their main problem with the current government or the future government, if it's Likud uh, who's forming it, is mainly those two first parties that you see on the red list, United Torah and Shas. Yes. Because those are the parties that, obviously, when you're, you're creating a government and you're making a coalition with other parties, you have to answer to them somehow, just like I, I think we could compare this to Trump and the evangelicals, right? He has to answer to them on some levels. So um, Netanyahu has had to answer to United Torah and Shas, and that means the egalitarian uh, spot of the Kotel, out of the picture, uh, conversion law, all these things, even nation state law, which is something that a lot of uh, American Jews see as problematic. Um, all these things are just a result of who he's allying himself with. Um, so I think that that's, that's what has driven the rift so far. And if, again, Netanyahu is making this uh, next coalition for the 21st Knesset, that means nothing much is going to change okay, on that I side. Okay, I want to come back to that in a minute, but I want to give you a chance. How, you, how do you view the American Jewish attitude about the relationship between Donald Trump, who by and large American, Israel, American Jews despise, mm -hmm. and Benjamin Netanyahu? And you know, um, you spoke in Flo Miami, was it Miami? Where did you speak? And I spoke today in Midwood, Brooklyn, to a lovely group of, it was the National Council of Jewish Women. Lovely. And they are so pro-Israel, and they hate Donald Trump. And they're conflicted. They say to me they're conflicted because, on the one hand, they're thrilled that the embassy was moved to Jerusalem. But they believe Donald Trump is just bad for America, and they don't trust him. And the fact that Bibi Netanyahu is so close to him, in some way the whole thing rubs off. Now, you've been observing this from the moment he was elected, from the moment Trump was, a, even when he started running. What's your analysis? Well, they're remarkably the same in some ways, at least with respect to the way their own countries view them. Um, you know, for Donald Trump, uh, he's proudly proclaimed that he could go shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, and <laughs> the, his core would not leave him. And I think in Israel, there's a very similar view. The core BB supporter is not concerned about the bribery and corruption case. It mm -hmm. means nothing to them. Mm -hmm. This is their guy. Mm -hmm. This is the guy with the booming economy. This is the guy who defends the homeland. This is the guy who got helped get rid of the Iran deal. This is the guy who's got the relationship and the Rolodex with other foreign leaders. 
he's their guy, and that's what they're interested in. So that, in that way, they're similar. In other ways, too, uh, the anti-immigrant rhetoric that you see with Trump, right, is similar to what, to some degree, what you saw with Netanyahu in speaking of blue and white as if they're a socialist party, or mm -hmm. yet they're going to form a, the, there will be an Arab, there will be a Palestinian state if you give this to Gantz, which only gives you another example of how far we've come, mm -hmm. because the, this is the insult. The insult is that Gantz might actually try to re revive a two-state solution, mm -hmm. which is really the frightening thought. And if you were a member of Peace Now, or for that matter, what you've, decide, you've described in the charts, the, the plummeting of the, of the party of Ben-Gurion, that labor is not relevant anymore. It's just shocking, right? They're not in the game. This is the party of Shimon Peres. It's the party of Yitzhak uh, uh, Rabin. Rabin. And they're not in this discussion at all. And maybe it's because Oslo is dead, and the Israelis have just looked practically, as you've pointed out, about, well, you know, we don't have a partner on the other side. The Palestinians are not meaningfully interested in nation building. And you believe that to be true. I, yes, I think that Sadly. I think it's, it's, it's the hopelessness of this situation and the moral craziness of Israel's dilemma. Because, you know, yes, of course, peace now. But now? How, how now? How could it possibly be now? Yeah. That's the problem. Peace is a good word. It's the now. Yeah. Now assumes that there's the possibility of actually dealing with partners who aren't interested in firing rockets or incendiary kites uh, or stabbing or running people over in their cars, uh, who are truly interested in building a state for themselves mm -hmm. rather than trying to destroy the Jewish one. Um, so I just think that there is a kind of strong man uh, perception that both Trump and Netanyahu share. They have a very similar, I would say, core support. Uh, it is interesting, right? It's the evangelicals in the United States that are pro-Israel, right? And they're also pro-Trump. Uh, and you know, the Israelis that adore Bibi, uh, they have just named a train station for Trump, right? These are the same people that say, why wouldn't American Jews love this guy? I know, Ameri yeah. but Israelis say that to me all the time. Yeah, I, I, I want to pick up on that thread. I think that um, what we, you could document a calculated change in the prime minister's speak taking a direct page out of Trump's playbook, in which he, uh, a couple of years ago, decided to vilify the media. Um, as Danielle mentioned, um, try to make the word left and traitor synonymous yeah, uh, in, in what he was doing. And let me just call out the elephant in the room, is that I think, especially in my movement, we are definitely the most concerned with the courting of the Haredi parties, the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic parties, and giving them essentially the keys to the coalition uh, to be able to hold it hostage uh, based on their policies. But I think the big one for many, many, I would say not just liberal Jews, and I, I'd be interested to hear what Richard has to say about it also, is the open and blatant courting of the Otzma Yehudit party, the Jewish power party, that you would think that Netanyahu would have someone do this on his behalf, but he, he was open, you know, making the phone calls. Um, one of the first calls he made tonight was already to Betelo Smutrich, who is a, I, I would consider an extreme right-wing uh, Knesset member who has been talked about possibly becoming the Minister of Education, um, and inviting them in and promising them prominent uh, places in the, uh, in the right union party. Uh, and it looks like Itamar Ben-Gvir might make it into the Knesset, uh, who is a disciple of Kahane, espouses racism, espouses you know, xenophobia, homophobia, all the things that I think many of us stand against. Um, and it was a clear tactic on Net Netanyahu's part to drum up his base and say, okay, forget about the guys on the left. We're not even, I have no interest in going to a national union. I want to do whatever keeps me in power. And some of the right-wing parties were interestingly complaining almost that he is trying to outright the right. Uh, and to say that he's taken uh, seats from us. And that's, that's not actually the case, because everyone runs on their own, and they can do whatever they want to, to, to get as many seats. I'll say one more thing, is that some of the criticism of Netanyahu has been that, um, and if you remember, Gantz's first campaign commercial was all about how many Palestinians he killed in Gaza uh, over, the, over his time as commander-in-chief of the army, as chief of staff of the army. Uh, and Netanyahu, in his Likud cabinet, has no clear 
security person who is the, as we would say in Hebrew, the bitchonist, you know, the, the clear security um, expert who might be the minister of defense. Avigdor Lieberman, who served in that position for two years, might be that person. Naftali Bennett was hoping for that, not looking like it's going to happen. Whereas Gantz um, has a conglomeration of three parties in the Blue and White Party, three former chiefs of staff, as we mentioned, another former finance minister in Lapid, but also not a left-wing party at all, especially mm -hmm. looking at some of what I would call the Likud refugees who came over and joined in forces, Tzvi Hauser and, of course, uh, Moshe Yaalon, who served in, you know, multiple terms as defense minister and former chief of staff. And I think that Israelis are looking um, to the past almost, and, and, and forgive me for generalizing in sort of in a broad way, but I think there is a tremendous respect for two kinds of figures. One is a strong military, like a general figure. We've had that you know, over the years in Rabin and Barak and Sharon. Um, and there's also a deep respect for a grandfather type figure. Uh, and then Netanyahu, who has, you know, is the first prime minister of the, pro, po, you know, uh, of the established state generation, um, and has this air of, you know, I've been here, I've weathered the storm, I'm the one who plays in the international scene, and there's a deep, tremendous respect for that. I think that his move to the far right and the extremist right is deeply, deeply problematic for for many many, many American Jews, Richard, seeing what, that what, what was your I, sense of this? He's going for Otsma there, Yehudit, there. and people should understand that Otsma Yehudit has been criticized roundly. It had to go to the Israeli Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. The Israeli Supreme Court ruled that it should be allowed to be part of the election. Mm -hmm. and that's the same. They, they it, did ban one candidate, Michel one Benari, candidate, but not the no. part, not the party. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. in some way, I think one, a Jew in America has to be careful. There are a lot of things we may not like a lot of, about the individuals in Osama Yehudit, but we should make sure we understand. The Israeli Supreme Court ruled it was not a racist party and it had every right to run. You were going to say. I, they did indeed say that. I don't want to be in a position of defending Osama Yehudit in the slightest <laughs> right, right. Uh, and make it clear the organizations that I'm uh, mo most closely affiliated with definitely criticized that move, uh, and I think it was worth criticizing. But I don't think that it was an enormous moment in this campaign. It was, it was a mistake that was not reflecting, in my opinion, any serious sympathy by Bibi with that party. I think if, I would be, if he's elected, my serious doubt about the presence of that party in the government in any way, shape, or form is a very strong doubt. I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, as, for, as for his alliance with the ultra-religious right, again, these are issues that I think I, I have so much to say about and would prefer not to get into. We are going to come back to it, and I will make you get into it. Yeah, but right. hold on one moment. I want you to make a quick comment, then I want to go to our yeah. phones for a yeah, moment. Yeah, I just want to comment on the Trump parallel with Netanyahu. Please. I think that I, I get this question a lot because as a journalist, a lot of my friends uh, think that I... I know the answer to this, uh, why Israelis support Trump so much. And you have to understand that the news that they're getting in Israel is not what you're getting here when you turn on CNN and you see every single move that Trump did today or every right. single thing. They're not looking at domestic policy. They're looking at what he does for Israel. As far as they're concerned, he moved the embassy to Jerusalem. He declared the Golan Heights for Israel. He, he's just he doing great He pulled out moves. of the Iran deal. Iran he stopped pay for slay. All these things. He left two UN commissions and we can go that on were and on. Vi virulently anti-Israel. So that's for them, fabulous. For it, them, it's that's what they see, that and for them, they, that's that's the that's important what should thing. Matter to to them. them, he talks a straight truth that no other American president in a long time has spoken, and they don't right. see all However, the things that his, offend his each of us on a daily basis. Where nation. I think it is problematic. They don't care about his oh, lack of presidential and demeanor, and they shouldn't. And they right. shouldn't. Where right. I think it is problematic is that the Israeli uh, public today doesn't understand where this comes from. They don't know that, or, or they, they haven't really dived into the subject of the evangelicals and how that it affected the uh, move of the embassy. And Israeli shouldn't. Leave it alone at home. That's okay, another debate. We will debate. come back. <laughs> I want to go to the phones for one moment. I am thrilled to welcome to our discussion Malcolm Honline, the executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, and somebody you hear on JBS all the time. Malcolm, thanks for squeezing out and taking a moment on the phone with us. 
I've asked everybody who's here, and you, you know all of the panelists, I want your sense to, when you saw the results, which at the moment are unclear, blue and white and Likud seem to be neck and neck, it also seems as if, if, it, if we had to put money on it, it would look like Netanyahu is going to be able to form a new coalition government. What did you see here that may have surprised you? And what do you want us to know from your perspective is the significance of the early election results? Well, first of all, I agree with all of your panelists. So, <laughs> just, just for the record, okay. Richard made me say that. So, I, so uh, <laughs> uh, look, I think, first of all, we don't know the outcome, and it'll be quite a while till we do. But you're right, the range between the two, according to the exit polls, would be three, four, six, even. But the overall numbers seem to indicate that Netanyahu will be able to cobble together uh, a government. But I think there, there, there will be a lot of analysis, uh, and uh, especially with the army vote not yet in, to see how they will vote in this election, because that's usually a, a vote of confidence on their part, on the part of the young people. I sort of felt that Netanyahu would do better than some predicted when young people we spoke to in Israel indicated that they would vote for him. Some older people who important. used to did not vote for him. And I think that they went with Gantz because they felt, uh, you know, the BB fatigue factor. They felt the corruption issue. They were more affected. Young people were extolling the fact that he has built relations with the Arab world, that he's one of the few people in the world who talks both to Putin and to Trump. They uh, talk about the economic stability and the ability to sustain the startup nation, the innovation nation. And they attribute a lot of that. And early on, as you know, Netanyahu was really critical uh, when he was uh, Minister of Finance in establishing the framework for this. So I think a lot of these things came into play. And there were attempts to play on the religious divide, to play on other divides. I think people try to see beyond that. I think it has to be said that blue and white had a victory tonight. People, I think, initially and certainly throughout most of the campaign, did not think that they would score 30-plus seats in, in, the, uh, in the election. So one thing overall is that we should all be proud of Israel's vibrant democracy. I'm happy that it seems that Israel is moving towards a two-party system with a few fringes uh, around that are still critical and can be kingmakers. But this election could reestablish you know, a, a two-party system as the dominant factors in Israeli politics, which I think is healthier than the 40 parties that were running in this election, and perhaps 10 or 12 will make it into the, into the Knesset. The, uh, but most of all, to the public, we should celebrate the fact that in that region, no country has an election that really is free, democratic, the kind of competition, the media free to speak, criticize each other and criticize the policies. Um, and it's too often taken for granted that, uh, that, that, you know, when you have all of the criticism and delegitimization of Israel, remind them who's the one of democracy, where people of every race, religion, and creed, everybody has a right and a freedom to vote and vote their conscience. Malcolm, thank you so much for the insight in a moment. We will see each other very soon. Thank you, my friend. God willing. And watch well. out for your panel. <laughs> I love you. Malcolm Holmline of the Conference of Presidents. Anything, anybody want to react to anything Malcolm said or as you've heard the discussion thus far? Well, the point about the fact that this is a free election in which the candidates, the media, and the voters are all allowed to say anything they want without the slightest fear of repercussion. And certainly, you know, your newspaper is a living <laughs> example of that. Uh, is needs to be said and glad someone said it and I'm not surprised it was Malcolm who decided to say it. Okay. I, I, do, I do think it was interesting the point he made about the move to a two-party system um, in that you know, we mentioned the 
whole span and spectrum of parties from little tiny sectoral parties like the Pirate Party and, and all these interesting... Uh, or the Seniors Party. The, the that Seniors was Party, the video. Men's Family Rights Party, the yeah. Casino Party, you know, all these parties that were moving into that where I'm seeing in America, you could make the argument that we have a long established history of a two-party system, but that now within the large parties there are smaller splinter groups or factions within the large parties that may one day, you know, who knows, uh, you know, that, that something may happen with them. Um, I think that Israelis, again, I, I'm not sure this is a, a general trend to a two-party system, but, but that they are really calculating their vote as to who can uh, take over and become the next, the, you know, the next prime minister and the ruling party mm -hmm. in the Knesset, rather than um, a, a deep-seated ideological vote. So I think that's... Uh, that's th th that's important to note in my but opinion. But the dif yeah. yeah the difference though you know, with the splinters that Josh is talking about in the United States, which I think is remarkably different, mm -hmm. is that here the discussion is about the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and that's where all the uh, intellectual energy seems to be, and mm -hmm. certainly the celebrity edge seems to be. But I would still say the center have, has bottomed out in Israel, and the left is moribund. I mean, what we're seeing with you know merits and labor, these are very, very small numbers. Uh, Right-wing fringe parties, this is the reason why everyone predicted, I'm sure here, everyone predicted that regardless of the outcome between Likud and blue and white, Netanyahu would be given the mandate because the right-wing fringe parties were just far more powerful and they were in their ability to, to garner the 3.25% and pick up four seats. The fact that the, on the left there was even a concern that labor might even be out of the picture. I'm thrilled that they were able to get as many as they did. So I think that's the difference uh, on some level. Yes, there's a vibrant American uh, uh, Israeli democracy, but what you're not seeing is you're seeing the same kind of progressive energy that we have here on the left that we don't seem to have in, the, on, in Israel. I want to go back to our phones for one moment. Uh, we have somebody who I am thrilled every time he gives us some time. This is someone who is the, perhaps the, the leading jurist on the American scene. And he is yeah, a civil rights activist. He's professor emeritus at job. Harvard Sorry, Law School. And he is perhaps the most eloquent voice defending the state of Israel today, Alan Dershowitz, author of The Case Against Would BDS, Why Singling Out Israel for yes. Boycott is Anti-Semitic and Anti-Peace. Alan, I, I know you're on the move, so thank you for finding a way to talk to us. I want to hear whatever your reactions are to, so far, the results we've seen of uh, today's Israeli elections. Well, first, I'm on a train, so you may hear some announcements from the conductor as, as background sound. Uh, look, uh, Israelis have to determine their own future. I don't think people who are not Israeli citizens should be in any way trying to uh, influence the outcome of elections, whether it be government officials or ordinary supporters of Israel, the decision must be made under Israeli law and policies by Israelis. I think the results thus far are uh, inconclusive. It's very hard to know what um, the uh, final results will be because, you know, unlike the American system, which has an electoral college, Israel has the role of the president, which is uh, both legally defined and traditionally defined. Uh, the president uh, makes the first decision as to who he asks to form a coalition. Uh, traditionally, um, that's given to the candidate who has the greatest likelihood of being able to form a coalition. But uh, sometimes it could be given, theoretically at least, to the candidate whose party won the most seats. So we have to wait and see. The president has said he would stick to the usual tradition and under the usual tradition, subject to final counting, it may well be that um, Netanyahu gets the first crack at forming a coalition. And um, we'll see who he gets to join his coalition and, and what the prospects that hold. I mean, it's complicated by the fact that uh, it's very likely he may very well be indicted uh, uh, during his uh, prime ministership if he's allowed to form a, a coalition. And it may be that the coalition will fall apart if and when he is indicted. So we're in an area of great, uh, great uncertainty right now. 
I want you to answer one more question for me, Alan. It is amazing how you were brought into this election by some on the American Jewish scene who in some way were critical of Netanyahu because you were seen to be somebody who was going to defend him in some kind of law, in any kind of lawsuit against him and that in some way you had been co-opted by the Israeli scene because of your commitment to the State of Israel and somehow Alan Dershowitz's name gets linked to this election. I want to know how you felt about it and what we should know. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing that's happening in the United States. People think I'm a Trump supporter because I have defended his civil liberties and opposed the weaponization of the criminal justice system. I voted for Hillary Clinton. I'm a liberal Democrat. Um, I don't support President Trump's policies domestically. Um, I have the same view in Israel. I don't uh, support candidates in Israel. I don't take positions in Israel, but I am an expert in criminal law, and I'm actually an expert in Israeli criminal law. I have taught uh, the subject of Israeli criminal law, and I feel very strongly that the case against Netanyahu is not one that should have been brought or should be brought. And I would say the same thing whether I supported him or didn't support him. Um, and uh, so to bring me in to say I'm trying to influence the election um, is wrong. I also defended uh, Omer uh, when he was uh, charged, and certainly Omer and Netanyahu don't get along with each other. They're at each other's throats. and. Uh, you know, if, uh, if Gantz were to be uh, prosecuted or indicted, say, for letting his telephone be hacked, I would be defending him as well. So it's wrong to assume that when I speak up on behalf of somebody's civil liberties or against the criminalization of political differences, that I'm either supporting that person politically or intruding into an election. That's just a false charge. Alan, you know, no one has made a better contribution, a more important contribution not only the State of Israel, but to American Jewish life. I am always enraged for you when I hear the nonsense that's thrown at you. And I always appreciate so much well, that... Well, I appreciate uh, that, but it's, it's, I have to tell you, it's getting worse. I know. Uh, the New Yorker has commissioned an article by David Remnick, who is strongly it's opposed it's to Israel. And my sources tell me that the reason that they've commissioned this article is to try to shut me down to try to steal my voice. And uh, of course, I won't let that happen. But uh, the idea that uh, opponents of Israel and opponents of our current president are trying to weaponize the New Yorker now and turn it as a way of trying to silence uh, people with whom they disagree is the worst role that journalists can ever perform. Journalists are supposed to support freedom of speech. They're not supposed to be part of the mechanism of suppressing freedom of speech. And the New Yorker is now in the process of trying to suppress my freedom of speech. It won't work, it, but uh, it's going to make it, uh, it's going to, you know, it's going to affect my credibility and my voice. I'm the sorry, yes. That with this hit piece. But, you know, I will fight back. I've been used to fighting back against false charges. I will continue to do so. Alan, all the best to you. Kol Tupah We will talk again very soon. Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you very much. Be well. be well. Take care. Okay. We only have a few moments before we go to our, our top of the hour break. You're a lawyer. When you hear Dershowitz say these things and you hear how they're coming after him, what's your reaction? Um, you only have a minute. Yeah, well, uh, it's going to take more than a minute. Look, uh, you know, it is extremely unfashionable. Look, in America, as you pointed out, Israelis see this as the Trump factor as how does it affect them, as it should. Um, you know, in the United States, MSNBC, CNN is devoted to Trump all day, and it's it's all day. And so, you know, uh, there is, as he's pointing out, there it, it is an incredibly unfashionable. There are a number of things that are unfashionable in certain uh, circles, university life, intellectual magazines. One is to to defend Donald Trump on any level, and two is to uh, criticize Palestinians. These are two things that are just not done. And I think that he's fallen on the other side of that. You know, you, you may have heard about the, you know, the shunning of Alan Dershowitz and Martha's Vineyard, right? I mean, you know, there was a whole front page story. Front page story Times. about, I don't even know if it's true. It is right? true. But that, he that when he true. goes to the general store, he's snubbed. Yes. Uh, and, you know, this is like, you know, 10th grade. It's crazy. <laughs> it's like it's 10th crazy. grade. So. Danielle, Josh, Richard, and Thane, we're going to pause for just a moment. You're fabulous. <laughs> we will continue with part two of our discussion of the Israeli elections and what they 
may mean for the state of Israel and for the United States American Jewish community. So please stay with us. You're watching JBS Expanding Jewish Understanding. fans of JBS and all things Jewish. We've got a new and exciting way to enjoy your favorite Jewish content as podcasts. Listen to all new editions of the premier JBS interview series L'Chaim and the hard-hitting current events program In the News, now available in podcast form on iTunes and wherever you stream your audio. Enjoy at your convenience, free of charge, anytime, anywhere. Television Worth Watching is now available as audio. Tune in to JBS Podcasts. Want to know what programs will be on JBS in the coming week? Then sign up for the JBS Sunday email, which highlights future JBS programming and gives you the JBS weekly schedule, which you can print out and refer to throughout the week. And it's so simple to do. Just visit our new JBS website at jbstv.org and click on Newsletter Sign Up and fill in your name and email address. And every Sunday morning, you'll receive an email with JBS programming information. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding, celebrating all things Jewish. You're watching JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, expanding Jewish understanding. Mark Golub, welcome back to JBS's live Israeli election night 2018 analysis with a wonderful studio panel that I'm joined with. Of course, it's Thane Rosenbaum, Richard Stone, Josh Weinberg, and Danielle Ziri, all of whom have already brought marvelous insights. I want to talk now about how this election might affect American Jewry and its relationship. We've touched on it a little bit. And I'm not letting you off the hook. There's a lot made, especially within the reform movement and the conservative movement, that there's a feeling that because the state of Israel has not been able to move forward on Jewish pluralism that, in essence, validates non-Orthodox streams of Judaism, even modern orthodoxy is not accepted within the state of Israel, that in some way the movements are arguing that Israel is in some way snubbing, is some, in some way dismissing, it is not embracing reform Jews or conservative Jews or secular Jews, and that this makes them feel that there's a distance, that they, there is a widening divide. It's gone so far as there are some in the movement who have suggested that, is, that Jewish money should be withheld, and political support in the United States Congress should be withheld until Israel comes around and changes its policies vis-a-vis, -vis, it's called religion, but Jewish practice, especially as it, uh, it informs 
aspects of Jewish family. Who is a Jew? How are you married? How are you buried? All of these issues, as well as what kind of Jewish observance should be part of the Jewish state. And so Josh alluded to this at one point, and there was upset. You also, Danielle, alluded to the fact that the compromise that was made over the third section of the Western Wall at Robinson's Arch, the rug was pulled out from under it because Benjamin Netanyahu did not want his government to fall. A rather sort of obvious political decision, but there are some people who felt he should have gone to the mat on this, and if his government fell over it, so be it. And that until, until the State of Israel changes its policies vis-a-vis -vis the way non-Orthodox Jews are treated, there's going to be this divide and this separation, and you won't feel like Israel is your country. And when Netanyahu wins again, and it looks like the Orthodox parties will be part of a coalition, it's most likely, this seems to reinforce negative feelings within Reform Jews and conservative Jews, non-Orthodox Jews, for the state of Israel. I have my own feelings about that, <laughs> but I want to hear your feelings now. Well, you're going to probably have to cut me off <clears throat> because it'll go on too long, and I'll try to make it concise. And I'll try to make it as inoffensive as possible to anyone. That means Look, you, Josh. Th this is, and Josh, you will get a chance th to respond. This is a, uh, there's a disconnect and total lack of understanding between American Jews who are not, uh, who are in the liberal streams, belong in the liberal streams, and Jews in Israel, including secular Jews who are not, who don't consider themselves orthodox, may have varying degrees of observance. The disconnect and lack of understanding is gargantuan and has some very unfortunate uh, repercussions. The fact of the matter is that for reasons that are peculiar to American Jewish history, the liberal denominations established both a, a dominance early in American history among Jewish immigrants and a legitimacy that has never been established uh, within the Jewish world in, in its history for movements that did not observe halacha, Jewish law, and that provided such a minimal education to Jewish children. It's now four or five generations of that, and the result of it is the state of liberal Jews uh, in America, which is that their religion is in many ways much more liberal politics than it is Judaism, even if they have some uh, attachment to Judaism of some sort from families or whatever. And that their rate of intermarriage is now in the 70, 80 percent range, which means that it's almost a random chance for them to marry Jews. I wouldn't be surprised if non-Jews on a campus like uh, in which there's a heavy Jewish population are almost as likely to marry Jews as Jews are. And that is a remarkable, unique situation that presents tragedy and extreme challenges that are not present okay, how or does understood it affect in Israel. Israel. Well, in Israel, even secular Jews, and there are some exceptions, there are sec some secular Jews who want the, Secular Jews complain about the fact that the Orthodox rabbinate in Israel, which is the only rabbinate really in Israel, uh, wants, uh, imposes limitations on them. There's secular marriage that you have to oh, get out fact, of the country. In fact, a lot of them come here to get yeah. married. You even have to, secular, they go to Jewish Cyprus, they come here. Cyprus. No, no, no question about it. It's a, it's a tremendous mess. And, and, and they uh, resent that very much. Um, but they don't, Israeli Jews don't understand the world of liberal denominations. They understand the world of Orthodox and Orthodox rabbis and to the extent that they'd prefer just to be secular, they have that resentment against the rabbinate. But those are two totally different situations. And I want to correct something. I really, not something that you said, but the, an idea that you posed. I, I, I don't think there is delegitimization and disrespect for Jews. There is delegitimization and disrespect for movements that are not based on halacha. And on Jewish yes, education. but it is, it is expressed personally. And it is. And it it is, is expressed personally. And it's very. It's it's a 
it's too a division within Jews that I don't know, frankly, how to correct. I will say one thing. No matter how much a reform Jew, including a reform Jewish rabbi, resents the way that movement is treated with, at the Wailing Wall, for example, at the Western Wall, or if they're not as funded, their institutions are not as funded as Orthodox institutions. I think to withdraw support from Israel on that basis is totally wrong and unjustified. I think that Israel, the presence of Israel as a refuge for Jews all over the world, including those who think their, that their denomination is excluded, they will be welcomed to Israel in exactly the same way. The perpetuation of Jewish culture and Jewish religion and Jewish learning that has been enabled by the astonishing miracle of the state of Israel, which now has half the Jews, more than half the Jews in the world living in it, I think that to, to risk turning away from support of Israel on that ground is a terrible mistake. Okay. One, hold on, I will let you answer. I can feel I'm, the steam coming. So. I, yeah. Oh, he's handling very well so far. I want to ask you a specific we, we've done question. This before. I want to see if you can give me a specific answer. Yeah. Should Israel change its policies in terms of the way it treats the non-Orthodox? I debate that internally. I, the I answer is not necessarily essentially, yes. Essentially, essentially uh, I, I think my own view is probably not. Okay. Bowie, when I want you to respond, I'm looking for the response. What I, do you I wasn't looking to get into this topic. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just understand. What do you think Richard said that was in some way factually wrong? So, first of all, I'm glad that we're talking about this. I, I think it's a really critical point, especially on the mind of the majority of American Jews, which, you know, the reform movement is the largest movement in uh, Jewish religious life in North America. I'm not sure where we came to the conclusion that uh, dissatisfaction or mm -hmm. I would say anger with the current orthodox or ultra-orthodox monopoly on religious life would therefore lead to somehow of a divestment or defunding of Israel. Well, I, read our, stories, our I, read, I read stories about reform, so, uh, huge, our movements, yeah. very wealthy reformed yeah. Jews threatening to withhold that, a million dollar pledge yeah. because of this yeah, issue. Well, this I'm, I'm sorry to hear oh, yes. that. Our movement's response from an official movement standpoint of the reform movement has been not only are we not going to withdraw support, we're going to double our support. And we're going to encourage well, good for our, you. our people to respond. And the question is, support of what specifically? I would say that the um, majority of dollars flowing to the state, outside of Congress and foreign aid and the Memorandum of Understanding, the majority of philanthropic dollars that are flowing to Israel today are not flowing to the government. They're flowing to the NGO culture that I'm proud to say Israel has the highest percentage of NGOs uh, per capita than any other country in the world. Now. It's the civil society that needs funded precisely because the government is not funding uh, you know, the, the liberal movements and the reform and conservative movements. And what I would say is that Israelis are waking up to a new reality. And Israelis are trying to break the mold in which the polarizing dichotomy between re secular and religious mm -hmm. no longer e answers the needs of the mainstream. And we're seeing this sprout up like mushrooms after the rain, congregation after congregation, kihila after kihila, saying, wait a second, just because we have a Jewish state doesn't mean that we have a Jewish community. And we may be frustrated or angry at the ultra-Orthodox establishment who prevents, who goes directly against paragraph 13 of the Declaration of Independence in which it clearly says freedom of religion. Right? We may be dissatisfied with that, but we have this innocent curiosity uh, of what it means to be Jewish. And so we're looking for answers, and we're looking for opportunities to express that. The Orthodox are not going to provide the answers for us. We're looking for something that is deeply authentic and Jewish, deeply meaningful, and inclusive and tolerant of people's differences and, uh, and, and diversity. Okay. Well, this just, election yeah, exacerbate, but you have to hold on. Yeah. No, You're the Israeli. You go last. <laughs> <laughs> Does this election exacerbate the problem? I think 100%. Because? Because, because it gives the two ultra-Orthodox parties exactly what they want. 
right? There is no different than it was a year ago. I don't Absolutely think much not. is will yeah. have changed, I and mean, now yeah. we're seeing the polls are. You know, it's very clear that why should else it going exacerbate? To why? Why did you say to me now? Whatever upset because we Because I had, think it's even less of a question. I'll give you an example. In 2013, when Netanyahu uh, formed his coalition, including the ultra-Orthodox mm -hmm. parties, he said, okay, let's take an issue that we can solve. He didn't like it that it was making headlines and that women were being arrested for the crime of wearing a talit uh, in public at the plaza of, of the Western Wall. So he said, let's fix it. He gave it to Nathan Sharansky, who was the head of the Jewish agency at the time. Um, later on, gave it to its cabinet secretary, uh, Avichai Mendelblit, who is now uh, the attorney general, and said, deal with this. It passed the government 15 to 5 on January 31st, 2016. And then it was only sort of torpedoed by the ultra-Orthodox members of the coalition who said, you know, a, a, as you rightly stated, um, that we'll collapse the government. And we all understand Netanyahu's calculations of not doing that. But the time has come. So I think it's exacerbating because I don't think Netanyahu is even entertaining such thoughts anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that he doesn't feel that he needs to okay. for political gain. I understand. And I think that he's discounting a majority of the Jewish world. Look, you're a secular Jew. I was you, just going to say that. You, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm the only one of your guests who's male who's not wearing a yarmulke. And the host, is a, and the host yeah. is a rabbi. Yeah. And yet you might not that be that surprised by what I might say about this. I mean, say. I, well, you know, Israel is always a special case for so many reasons. It's treated differently. There's always, <laughs> I would argue, a double standard again on Israel no matter what. Here's another example. Uh, Catholics don't take positions about the Vatican and say we're never going to go to Rome again, or we're not going to. We would withhold support from Rome. Uh, Irish Catholics don't do the same. Well, I couldn't possibly support Ireland anymore. Uh, American Jews feel a proprietary interest in Israel that Israelis would argue, secular or religious, is, is unjustified. Uh, you're, you know, remember was it Hatlovi? Is that how she pronounces her name? The deputy. Foreign Minister yeah. who you know made uh, a gaffe. Hotavelli. Hotavelli. Yeah. Sorry, I never pronounced her name correctly. Yeah. But but you know she she got in hot water for making a comment that I know I've been saying for years, which is, your kids don't serve in the IF, IDF. Shut up, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. just really. How arrogant are you mm -hmm. that you don't have to bear the sacrifice of what it meant mm -hmm. to really build this state? I get it. You planted trees, and you went to a kibbutz, and you take love. You have a real feel of love. But this idea, it's, I call it moral narcissism, that Israel owes American J liberal Jews, and, and I, of whom I consider myself one, owes them an apology for their conduct towards the Palestinians, towards religious people, is just nonsense. I mean, it's just it's arrogant and nonsense to say, I used to love you, Israel, and now I can no longer love you, that you've fallen out of my good grace. And so while I, I would agree with everything that Josh and Danielle would say, there is the, oh, the you kind haven't of... haven't heard a, me yet. Yeah, I know, but I'm saying, <laughs> I can only imagine. Because I would just say, look, you know, there is a kind of, uh, uh, of expectation and, and, and a sense that you owe us something mm -hmm. because of the support that we get. And frankly, I'm not even sure Israel, you know, I don't even think the financial support is all that important or meaningful to the Israelis anymore. Mm -hmm. So it does kind of has a kind of holding our feet to the fire when we're not bearing the same sacrifices. We're not having the same experience. Uh, nobody who lives in Long Island had to worry that their house was hit by a rocket, uh, ever, right? But this is how Israelis live. And so I do think that there is this, this conflict. It's, it is significant. We're seeing it in lots of ways. This election, I think, does, to some extent, exacerbate it. Why? Because? Well, because this just makes this, from the perspective of a liberal American Jew, this says, to the, this says that Israel has written us off, that they have elected a prime minister who is not interested in meaningful peace talks with the Palestinians, that is using language in this last week. I think someone said here tonight we're talking about, well, you know, Netanyahu, uh, you know, doesn't have the kind of same, the edge or something about Trump saying, yes, but, you know, there was the words annexation of, 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 the, West of the West Bank, Bank uh, invoked this week. Yes, for electioneering purposes, but language that from an American Jew's perspective, liberal Jews is outrageous. And we don't seem to care about the, 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 the lack of connection, not just to Israel from the perspective of policies, but also religious observances. 
in a sense, there was within the American Jewish community this hope that this election would finally be the end of Bibi. Yes. In fact, and when it isn't, you're saying, be, even though it's only a continuation of what was there, what, six months, four and five months ago, even though it's only a continuation, nothing's worse, nothing's changed. Well, according to you, it's actually better because... What is it? Did you say they had le he had less votes this year than he had the last, or did, was well, it who? more? Netanyahu. No, more. He had more. more. He had more. Yeah. Okay. I didn't say, I didn't go ahead and use any words of value. What I'm saying is, I, I assume what those of you who, the, the way it's being discussed at this table is, because there was an expectation yes. that the left was gaining popularity and strength, and everybody's already said this. The fact that Meretz is at five and stays at five is very significant yes. in terms of the overall picture of the state of Israel. But what you're saying, and Josh, is, in essence is what you said, because we had expectations, they, they are now dashed, makes it feel worse. Yeah, now, I, I want to tell the audience okay. something. We're going to update our numbers at the moment. It now turns out that a number of news sources are, are reporting that Likud and Benjamin Netanyahu have now won 40 seats, and that Gantz has 35. So although it says 37 and 36 on the board, imagine Likud now with 40 and blue and white with 35. If Likud has 40, I don't know if it'll end up with 40 at the end of the night mm -hmm. or at the end of tomorrow. If it has 40, that's a significant change in what the balance of, of the Israeli electorate the, is saying. And, and it especially reflects a strong confidence in Bibi on part of the Israeli electorate, yes. given the pending indictments. Yes. And now I want it, Now I come to the Israelis. My turn. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I hope, and you, but you've, you've lived in America a long time, correct? About five years now. Okay. But you have a good sense of who the American Jew oh, is. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, but I want, I want to jump I'll, exactly I'm gonna, on I'm that. Gonna okay. give, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to just let you talk. All right. I just want to say to you, You've heard three American Jews mm -hmm. talk about how Israelis feel. Yeah. I would be curious to know in your answer, as you describe your response to this, to what extent are any of these three correct? Josh says there's a mushrooming of non-Orthodox Judaism in Israel. I haven't experienced it. Mm -hmm. I don't have people sitting at this table, mm -hmm. except those who are in the Reform Movement in Israel saying that to me. No non-Reform Jew has told me there's a mushrooming <laughs> of non-Orthodox interest uh -huh. in the state of Israel. I'd love to know, look, you're a younger person. <laughs> what do you and your friends think about this? You, you said as a side comment, yes, many, many people your age will come to the United States or go to Cyprus to be married because mm -hmm. they hate the way the Orthodox. Yep. But that's been true for generations, Absolutely. and the Israeli people, the electorate, has lived with this without making an issue of it, election after election after election. And I just want to hear, you want to hear one more thing an American Jew says to you. Okay. I want my audience to know, if they're non-Orthodox, if they're Reform, Conservative, Reconstructionist, Chavura, new, whatever, when they get off the plane in Israel, the fact that they're not Orthodox will not impinge, impinge upon any experience they have. Spend a week, two weeks, a month, a summer, a year. Go and if it. they want to go to a Reform synagogue, there are Reform synagogues all over. You want to go to a Masorti synagogue? Mm -hmm. There are Masorti synagogues. There's one place at the moment that's a problem. Mm -hmm. You go to the Western Wall, you can't stand with your wife, although you can go to Robinson's Arch now anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for most, most of an American Jews visit to Israel, there is no separate, the Israeli people don't take this seriously. Mm -hmm. As far as the Israeli people are concerned, we're okay. all Jews. So, um, so I, can, I can agree with that statement, we're all Jews, right? But I think all three of my co-panelists here are right in what they said. Um, certainly you're right in the perception that you um, illustrated from Israelis that, hey, how do you have a right to even tell us what to do with our own country? We're a sovereign, sovereign nation. And yes, until you go to the army, maybe, maybe then we can talk, but before then, no. Um, your point that there is a clear divide and a lack of understanding on both sides, 
Absolutely true, and I've covered this extensively. I can tell you that in the past three years, all of my coverage almost has been towards that point in some way or other, in different uh, manifestations of it, but definitely that point. And I think what you're saying is true because I see this, again, personally, uh, when I talk to friends and people in Israel, but I also um, I see this here. I think that Israelis do want more options in terms of their religious um, uh, kind of expression. I have a very good friend who's also an Israeli journalist who, uh, for example, the, is, they're both Jewish. They didn't want to get married in Israel. Um, a lot of the ceremony doesn't reflect her values. Calling um, her husband Bali, which in Hebrew tra in, in English translates to my owner, is very problematic for her. She calls him my partner in Hebrew. So I, I've observed all three of these things. What I can tell you is that we cannot um, underestimate the impact or the problem that, that this divide poses for Israel multiple uh, reasons why. But I can tell you that I've spoken, and, and last story I did about this on Khan television, I've interviewed Josh about this as well, and you, you saw the story, but I interviewed their senior Israeli diplomats here who, um, even though they represent the Netanyahu government and have very much of that view that you, that you expressed about Israelis not, shouldn't, that, that people shouldn't tell Israelis what to do with their own um, country, has told me that, that diplomat has told me, listen, it's, pro it's a problem because for Israel to be um, a flourishing um, Jewish state in the Middle East, they need that Jewish community in the U.S. to support it. And not just financial, financially, but to sort of be the backbone and vice versa. American Jews couldn't be the way they are here today and a flourishing community many different parts of the country if there wasn't a state that legitimizes that. I think it's a complete cross relationship that has to be taken very seriously. So yes, Israelis don't see um, the importance of religious pluralism. Maybe it's not on the top of their agenda right now. I can tell you that coming from Israel, when I moved here, I had no idea there were so many different ways of doing Shabbat. And I had no idea there were so many different movements within the Jewish community. And, and every day um, dealing with the Jewish community, every day covering the Jewish community here, I discover things that are new to me as an Israeli and that I'm exciting sure... Exciting things, yes. Uh, very exciting things and that I'm sure Israelis are absolutely not aware of. I think the, the key here is to, um, um, let's say, bring the two communities together not by... Um, giving these people what they want and those people what they want, but by educating about them. If there's a birthright where Israeli, uh, uh, where you know, American Jews go to Israel to better understand Israel, there should be a birthright of Israelis coming here to better understand the Jewish community because I think that maybe not now, maybe not immediately, but in the years to come, that relationship is extremely important for Israel and I think that investing in kind of bringing those two together just in terms of understanding. They don't have to accept each other, they don't have to, but I think the understanding um, is very important. Okay, I think you say it fabulously. <laughs> I'm very grateful. I don't think, however, any of, I shouldn't say, these two, and certainly I, do not disagree with one word you've said. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe it, it speaks to the issue. And I want to understand who you are. You have been here for about five years. Absolutely, yeah. Where were you born? In Israel. But where? I was born in uh, Wolfson Hospital in Cholon, in Israel. In Cholon. However, I have not grown up in Israel. Uh, so I'm not your typical Israeli. I see. Where, um, are your parents in Israel? My parents are Israeli. They're both in Israel. Okay. Do they belong to the reform movement? No. Masorti movement? We are a completely secular family. Okay. Do they have any interest in reform or Masorti? Absolutely not. Your friends <laughs> in Israel. Don't tell me about your Israeli friends in America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Israelis who come to America are exposed to a totally different situation mm -hmm. that doesn't in any way invalidate it. But I, they, do know, they do not represent So let me answer. Israeli I get your culture. point that you also made when you asked me the question about the fact that there is What's no limitation. What's my point? Your point is that there is no limitation for Reformed Jews. When they go to Israel, they're accepted and just my like... my point is there's no mushrooming. Your parents are not part of a mushrooming. I don't know I think, any of your I think friends who are, are part of a mushrooming. I think those hot. are not the examples that, <laughs> that he was referring to. I think that I'm observing it yeah. in my own age group. You in, are observing it? Yes. In, in Israel? Absolutely. 
so many people who I, I see in religious, not religious ceremonies, so, and they're not oh, a gay you, couple, I, I, and they're not, and these things are very important for, because, not because there's a limitation on their freedom, but because it just doesn't reflect their values. And, and it might not be an existential threat, but it's personal to a lot of people. I can tell you when I, when I covered this from here, I, can, I, can, I don't agree with the point of, um, uh, that, that there's a phenomenon of people kind of uh, divesting from Israel because of this. On the contrary, what I've observed from my reporting, yes, maybe some people have made that personal decision of not giving millions of dollars that they used to give, but I think that um, in my personal experience, I've noticed that when, when Israel's back is against the wall, at the end of the day, they'll support it. Mm -hmm. It's not a question of not supporting Israel or not. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of seeing our, uh, the, the American Jewish community would like to see themselves also reflected in the mirror Absolutely. of Israel. Absolutely. And I want last question, then I will, <laughs> you can then speak all you want. <laughs> Do your friends care about the Western Wall? Um, my friends know. A lot of my friends know. I, I, a lot of my friends are secular. Okay. So the Western Wall is something we do uh, once a year for Yom Kippur. And, you and do? There, um, there yeah, are Israelis who never go to the Western absolutely, Wall. Absolutely. But you know, it's part of a, kind of a group outing. I know my brother <laughs> does it every year. He goes with his friends and then they have a nice dinner and it, it's, it's, it's and where more do you stand cultural when than... When you go, where do you stand? At the, in the women's section, yes. <laughs> okay. It never occurs to you to go to Robinson's Arch? No. Uh, Why not? It's just not something that I grew up in, if you will. I, I grew up in different countries but around the world. But now you've experienced America uh -huh. and the American Jewish perspective yeah. on this, and you understand why to American Jews this is significant. Oh, yeah, I can understand that. Do you think if you go next time, you'll go to the Robinson's Arch now that you've had this? Out of curiosity and wanting to see okay. it, and yes, but if you're talking about personally yes, my, personal. own, my own beliefs, you don't need um, it. for me being Jewish is a lot more of a cultural aspect. Um, I very strongly believe that we have to carry that on because so many people have died for us to be able to say today we're Jewish. Um, and, and that's something that I hold dear to my heart. My grandparents are conservative and you know when I go to their house it's a different scene. But um, but as far as I'm concerned, um, my Judaism it goes through a lot more of a cultural aspect okay, you to say it. That like a lot of also. secular you say Israelis. It beautifully. <laughs> you have been so patient, Thank and you. you've been ganged up on. <laughs> so, uh, with the recognition that I'm sitting next to two law professors, I would say with great humility that I, I think that you are leading the witness a little bit in that. Um, <laughs> oh, he which is, but I did which, which witness? I, I, I would not say that a case study of Danielle's parents, may they live long lives, is empirical data on Israeli society in any way. I said Let's there's look not at one Israeli <laughs> so, who I've talked and I talked to. Yeah. You know, but but there are studies on this, yeah, and yeah. There's, there's actually data on this. So the Jewish People's Policy Institute, which is an objective institute you know, funded by the Jewish Agency, put out a study just uh, a few months ago that showed that 13% of Israelis identify with the Reform and Conservative Movement, which was a growth of five, uh, they doubled. And just you know, to point out, I don't know if my, obser yeah. my uh, observations really is that they identify with any movement. Yeah. I just know that they see, them, they see this right. monopoly of the Orthodox parties over the religious aspect that's of Israel right. as a that's problem for their that, own that, that, Yes, that's a, we all agree there. We all yeah. agree. So if we're looking at, when I say mushrooming, I see a growth. I'm looking at data that, that, that demonstrates if that you're in talking a very 13%, clear way. If you're talking 13%, I have no problem. So that grew it's from, not what from, I thought you meant by mushrooming. It grew from 8%. And what I'm seeing is that 200 congregations are sprouting up from I'm across thrilled. the movements. I am Reform, thrilled. Reform, conservative, independent. There's a whole, what we call the Reshta Keilot, the independent congregational network that, that's growing. And, and, and I think more to the point that, uh, of I think what we're both saying is that I, I see one of the great tragedies that the two largest Jewish communities in the world, in North America and Israel, do not understand each other in, mm -hmm. a, in, a, in a really significant way. Um, I, I get accused all the time of, oh, your, your movement is leading to assimilation. Our movement is growing and is the largest movement in Jewish life. We don't talk about the, 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 the how do you say, the brecha, the escape, the run the from exotics, orthodoxy yeah. that we're seeing in a major, major way. I'm not doing that to, to be tit for tat, but I'm also seeing that we as the reform with the liberal movements are the on-ramp to Jewish life. Um, and that people are looking for places where they can go that are open and inclusive and, and, and accepting of them. And, and, I, and I think that that has yet to be reflected in politics. 
Okay, and that's what we're pushing for. It, I feel proud that it was our reform movement that led the Supreme Court appeal to bar Otzma Yehudit, or a candidate from Otzma Yehudit, from the, no, that we have a societal message. It's not just about how many weddings and how many bar mitzvahs can we perform. In addition to the kotel, which is a symbolic issue, the kotel is a symbol. Of course. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I think more people would go to Robinson's Arch if the deal was implemented and the uh, architecture was put in place as was agreed in the deal. But I think a much bigger issue is marriage. There are 300,000 couples in Israel that cannot get legally married. Right? You still have a case where in an advanced industrial democracy in 2019, an, a Muslim cannot marry a Christian in Israel. They also have to go to Cyprus. Okay? That to me is absurd. And how are we tolerating a policy that bars basic, what I would call civil rights, uh, that we take for granted here in the United States, in Western Europe, and everywhere else in the world, and in Israel, and, and trust me, I, 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 I think I'm a bona fide Zionist in my love and support for Israel. I made Aliyah, served in the army, lived there for 10 years. Um, but here, when we get to this issue, I think we need to stand up loudly and say that if we're going to be a Jewish state and a democratic state, okay, then we have to change the policy uh, of how religion is and how... how what it means to be Jewish in the Jewish state. And yes, American Jews have a very, very different, uh, if we call it, what, what they're allowed to say, what they're not allowed to say in terms of you know, what credibility we have to criticize Israel. But let's look at this from Israel's strategic point of view. Is that helping the cause, really? Is that helping the cause to make uh, the majority of North American Jews not feel welcome, not feel at home in the Jewish state when we say that this is the place for all Jews and all Jews? Do you feel is it really? that non-Orthodox Jews are made to feel unwelcome? I would say there are instances where, yes, that is the case. How? Okay. Let's say you converted to Judaism, and you have grown up your whole life as a Jew because your mother converted to Judaism, and you get to Israel and you say, oh, I'm sorry, you're actually not Jewish. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. Um, there, there's you're talking so about such many a, different... That's not I, what you meant. You meant that as a community, okay, yeah. it's a, as a community you feel that a movement is, is, is unwelcome. Uh, individual yeah, yeah, Jews, in, individual in, Jews in, have in problems all the way. time. But I, I think, I'm asking you whether I think you, there is a major effort on behalf of some of the ultra-Orthodox parties to so incredibly vilify you're and right. condemn you're the right. liberal You're right. I asked you a different question. Do you, so I, do I you feel, feel that unwelcome? Most feel, do you feel unwelcome? Do I personally? No, I go there no, all the time. of course. The time. But my wedding wasn't recognized in Israel. So, but, okay. But so, so, so does that, again, does that make me feel welcome or not welcome? I don't know. This is when my daughters want to get married in Israel, they're going to have a major issue. Yeah, I hope, so I hope people uh, listen to me don't misunderstand me. It's a big problem. Part yeah. of the problem I have yeah. is that a lot of what you say, there's no, nobody's pushing against you. The argument you make is not the argument. It's not, you're not addressing the issue. I would like Israel to fully embrace Jewish pluralism. Sure. The issue is the one that Thane brought up, and I'm bringing it up in the context of the election. This is a problem that must be addressed by the Israeli people. Mm -hmm. We have every right to lobby for our position. But in the end, if you love the state of Israel, it's not some idea you love. You love the people of Israel, and you want them to, to flourish and thrive and stay safe and be well. And you also want to, you want to let them know what matters to you. But it matters to you, and your job is to ultimately educate, change through experience, through time, but never to say they've got to. Can I, can and, I just make And point? I certainly don't yeah. feel, I, I don't personally feel, to ever, on, I'm not an Orthodox rabbi. And even if I was an Orthodox rabbi, there were things I would not be able to do unless I was a certain kind of Orthodox rabbi. So someone, I want to, I would to like me. to stand at the wall with my wife. But in the meantime, if I can't, and by the way, I can't at Robinson's Art, but I want it to be equal in stature to anywhere else on the wall. There should be three sections of the wall from my perspective. A reform rabbi who wants to, to be a Masada Kedushan at a wedding should be a Masada Kedushan at a wedding in the state of Israel. Amen. Okay. Someone However, I want Israelis to care. I don't want I, Mark Golub caring isn't the right answer. That. And that's all Thane was saying. No one's pushing against right. what you want. 
Well, the I, issue is how we get it. I, I thought you did ask about how this plays out in the American community and what we should think about it. So yes, and I'm saying I <laughs> my out. argument with you yeah. is I don't Danielle, believe yeah, yeah. it should change how American Jews feel about the state of Israel. So to your point, Mark, um, someone put it to me uh, very nicely um, in a metaphor. If you consider the Jewish community relationship with Israel a friend relationship, a friendship, then you know sometimes your friend does something you like, sometimes they don't, and you can choose to turn your back on them if they don't agree with you or whatever. But if you see it as a brother relationship, a fraternal relationship, it's your family. So even when they go against what you believe in, you, you will accept them either I way. I could not agree more. <clears throat> I want to make two comments. One, Josh has several times referred to the reform movement as the biggest Jewish movement in America. I don't know where else he means it. And if you, I suppose, count people who register on a poll with what, their, what denomination they identify with, though those numbers are going to are changing, I suppose that's right. And Josh is a very committed Jew and a very committed Zionist. But I don't think that the vast number of people that he's talking about in his movement reflect that commitment and that there's a serious, serious crisis of Jewish identity within the reform movement that I think is the result of four or five generations of no education and whatever else. I want to make a bigger comment about this conversation. This conversation in one form or another is not peculiar to this election. The, con the conversation about these dissidences between the American Jewish community and Israel are as old as I am as an activist in the Jewish community. <laughs> and that's so damn old, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> but the topic has, in fact, the words are incredibly the same, but the topic has amazingly changed because 40 years ago, the topic was the survival of Israel. Now the topic is the survival of American Jewry, in my opinion, mm -hmm. the future and survival of American Jewry. You're going to have to leave us in a minute. Yes, I'm sorry to so say that. So as you leave, I want, first of all, you reflect anything you want, say anything you want to, to this issue, or in general, uh, because ultimately, after you leave, I'm going to ask the same thing of the other three panelists. <laughs> What's your sense of it all? You know, we've, we, we'll have concluded two hours by the time we're done. We're talking about various aspects of the election and how it impacts. I just want you to s sort of give me your stream of consciousness here. Well, I mean, the elections once again demonstrate the vibrancy of Israeli democracy, pluralistic society. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> we are graced today by a Haaretz writer. <laughs> and frankly, there is no newspaper in the United States like Haaretz is to Israel. The level of criticism of the government's mm -hmm. policies, nothing like that exists. And yet she's engaged on JBS with us in a, in a, in a kind of liberal discussion and respectful discussion. And I'm so glad that you're joined us here. I think that, that this is a, a testament to what we've seen in terms of uh, uh, Israeli democracy. Um, but I also do think that, that there is, as Josh is saying, there is a, a, a divide, and it's a dangerous one. And I think Richard is talking about the same thing, which is that we're, we're losing generations of committed Jews, and Jews who grew up in a, an atmosphere of, yes, a vulnerable, fragile Israel. What Richard is essentially saying is that we have the luxury now to be critical of Israel, because that it's a regional superpower. This yes. is, this is, it's, this is the curse of the other side, right? He's saying Israel now is a booming economy, a, 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 a startup nation, a, a strong uh, military, of course, and it gives us the ability to, to poke behind the wheels. And this is what we're seeing. The real question is what you're raising, I think, is well, does it really matter? And the reason being that does it really change anyone's real experience when they go to Israel? And what Richard is saying is, and are these, and I, I know Richard didn't say this, <laughs> but I think he might have felt this. I'm saying this. Are they Jews? Are they still Jews? They may claim to be, but their connection to Jewish life, to Jewish experience, and to Israel is becoming much more attenuated. And that's the scary thing. But that, wait, that you're not suggesting they aren't Jews. 
Well, I mean, he's not suggesting there are Jews, but he's suggesting no. the crisis is tantamount to losing generations of Jews who have opinions on things but don't really reflect the better interest yeah. of the Jewish people or the state this, of Israel. This, this is close. OK. <laughs> You'll, you'll leave in a moment, but uh, thank you for being here tonight, course, as, always. as always. And I hope the rest of your night is just as good. <laughs> It'll always be best here on JBS. That is wonderful. We're going to go to the phones right now because we have somebody else that I, I'm thrilled to be able to bring on and have his uh, input. David Harris, the CEO of the American Jewish Committee. David, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. So, David... We're just discussing our reactions to whatever this election means. It looks like right now that Likud is representing is represented as having 40 seats and um, blue and white 35. And it looks like if there's a coalition government, it'll be formed by Bibi Netanyahu for a fifth time. And yes, the Orthodox parties will be part of that coalition, it looks like. As you look at it, what's this election mean to you? And are you heartened or disheartened? Well, uh, the first thing I would say, Mark, is um, never underestimate Benjamin Netanyahu as a politician. Um, uh, when he's down, he, he counterpunches, he fights back. Uh, he's determined to win, and um, this just proves once again that uh, he's, whatever one thinks of him uh, ideologically, politically, he's a formidable politician. So that, that's the first thing. Uh, secondly, uh, it does look like he will form the next government. It's true. Uh, but uh, he, he was given a run for his money, and I think a lot of credit has to be given to Betty Gantz, first of all, for the campaign that he's run. Secondly, for the ability of himself, Yair Lapid, Gavi Ashkenazi, and Moshe Yavon to put aside their own particular sort of egos, if you will, and come together as a quartet. Uh, that in a way began to upend traditional Israeli politics uh, and create a new example. So I think uh, you know I think this has been a fascinating election. Uh, there's still there's still things that have to unfold. Uh, as your previous speaker said, of course, and it must be repeated because there are accusations that Israel is is anything but a democracy. Uh, Israel is a full throttle, throttle democracy with all of its imperfections. Uh, and I think uh, this uh, election illustrates that as well. In a sense, Bibi may have won. It looks like he has. But Israeli democracy was also a clear winner. David, my understanding is, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, the AJC was very upset when Netanyahu reached out to far-right parties, especially Otsma Yehudit, and it's an inheritor of Kach that was founded by Mayor Kahana and outlawed by the Israeli Supreme Court. And my sense is, and if I'm wrong, you tell me, the AJC was critical of Netanyahu for doing that. Am I correct? Uh, we were. I mean, I, I think compared to some, we were a bit more restrained in the sense that we, we expressed confidence that the review process uh, would determine ultimately whether Osama Yehudit would be allowed to run as a party or not. Uh, but yes, uh, we took the unusual step, certainly for AJC, of, of uh, expressing our concern. And what became even more surprising, Mark, was that APAC followed in our footsteps. Yes. Uh, and uh, they actually cited our statement and said, we support yes. the AJC Sir, position the on this. Conference. And suddenly and you so had two of the most sort of staunchly pro-Israel establishment organizations AJC and APAC on the same side on this particular issue. Okay, so I want you to take one more minute and that's it. If you took that position, and Richard Stone is here and he also reminds us that the Conference of Presidents also followed the AJC lead, but if that's true, does this now mean you're in some way upset or disappointed that the Israeli people seem to have re-elected Benjamin Netanyahu to head the coalition government? I, I think, to be fair, Mark, elections are about many things all at once, and to try and isolate one particular issue and, and say this is reason enough to be disillusioned or disenchanted uh, probably underestimates the complexity of elections, whether in Israel or the United States. 
there are things that are that are going to upset us in the American elections. We're already beginning to see them. People associating with people that you know we may not be happy with. So no, we were not happy about the Ultima Yucatid story, Mark. But I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't jump from that to conclude that therefore we're unhappy with the prospect of a Netanyahu government. Number one, uh, we have always supported Israeli democratic results. This is no exception. We've worked closely with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu over many years. I personally have known him for over 30 years. Uh, and finally, I understand that as an American Jew, uh, I've had a choice in my life to make Aliyah. Uh, it was a long process in my own mind about whether to do it or not. Ultimately, we stayed here. Uh, I recognize that there's a fundamental difference between American Jewry and Israeli Jewry on, on, on this score. Israel has voted. I respect the process. And we will work as closely as we can with the next Israeli government as we have in the past to pursue our, our, our overlapping agendas of trying to strengthen Israel's place in the family of nations, trying to pursue peace opportunities, and certainly, Mark, trying to strengthen Israel diaspora relations. Uh, all, all, all could use a boost. You are fabulous, David. And I love the way you say it. And I'm so glad I had a chance to let you clarify here on JBS. You'll be well, and we will see each other very soon. Thank you, my friend. I look forward to it. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye-bye. David Harris, CEO of the American Jewish Committee. We're almost at the end. I don't want this to end. I want to go longer, but I can't. So I want to hear a closing comment from all three of you. And now it's not about American Jewry. It's in general. What do you think this is going to mean for the Israeli future? And I am going to start with the Israeli. Danielle, what do you think? Um, Look, it, I think we c what we have seen from this election, and we can't deny it, is that there is a push from the Israeli public that many uh, of Israelis want change, want some kind of change in the government. If it's not because of Netanyahu's corruption scandal, if it's not because his alliances with uh, the Orthodox parties, it is just because, you know, you have to to get the someone out of the chair to to replace him, and uh, and you know many argue that it's just been too long. But it, it looks uh, like he's going to be reelected. He's going to be reelected, and there's a saying um, in Israel that um, in Israel, when there's elections, no matter what you vote, you get BB. <laughs> um, so this uh, this has happened again. So does it disappoint it you? Uh, personally, I'm not going to uh, yes, express my, my personal view. You are a journalist. I shouldn't I'm a ask journalist. you. Yeah. Um, so I, my job is really to just look at what everybody is Did saying. Did your parents vote? My, oh, you're touching on a sensitive <laughs> subject. <laughs> okay. Um, my mother always votes. Yes. My dad and I have a lot of disagreement on this issue. Um, he does not like politicians, thinks that if we think we're making a difference, then we are blind and will not uh, waste five minutes of his time <laughs> voting. Um, my view is that um, even if you don't vote because you have a certain interest, um, you can do that for all the people in the world who don't have that privilege and right. Thank you, Daniel. Beautifully said. Josh. Yes. Um, in terms of what it means, I think that, um, again, more of the same is going to happen. And, and I am disappointed, I would say, because I think so many Israelis care about um, basic issues that are beyond the scope of the conflict that we'll say. If you look at the trajectory that was started, if you were to pick a moment in time, let's say the summer of 2011, mm -hmm. with huge protests streaming the streets of Tel Aviv, which led That's to a just... number of candidates who are now almost veteran Knesset members like Shmuley. Stav Shafir and Itzik Shmuley, mm -hmm. and even Yair Lapid came in, you know, wrote the text, as did Moshe Kachlon, came in with, uh, you know, he, he was able to broke, break the monopoly on the cell phone uh, companies. Um, and so people campaigning on an economic platform to try to better Israeli society. And I fear that those voices are now going to be irrelevant as Netanyahu will you know, cobble together a coalition um, and rule on more of the same. And I don't see him in the past 10 years having any sort of articulated vision for what he wants to see as the future of the state of Israel, right? Uh, you can say can security, 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 and that's important. And everyone who's going to be prime minister is going to be security. I think Gantz knows a thing or two about security as well. Um, but, but what's your vision? Where are you taking the people? 
um, what, what, what kind of state do you want to see for your children and grandchildren? And that's what, that's what really bothers me, and I didn't hear it this much in, in these elections. Yeah, you made a point early, and yeah. I thought it was very well taken. According to the reports, and you would know better than I, nobody running in this election expressed a vision for Israelis. It's not that, oh, Gantz did and Netanyahu didn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't part of the discourse, and in some way it's not part of political discourse in general. But your point is very well taken. Um, I'm, I'm always a little, a little surprised that you're an Israeli. You know Israel. You know Israel. Danielle knows Israel. Most American Jews I speak with, they know Israel as a tourist. And by the way, they love Israel. And I'm glad they know Israel as they, as they do. And I'm the same way. I'm not an Israeli. I've been to Israel many times. But I have none of the understanding that the two of you have. And so I'm a little bit more reticent to begin to tell Israelis whether they made a big mistake by reelecting Netanyahu mm -hmm. and that somehow the social fabric of Israel yeah. is now going to be torn. You may be right. I just don't know. And I think American yeah. Jews, I'm a little surprised that American Jews hate Bibi. I don't know why you would ever hate a foreign a prime minister of another country. And often it has to do with things that have nothing to do with policy. You, however, articulated something very, very important that I hope our audience did yeah, hear. And if I can just clarify, I, I'm not saying whether Israelis made a mistake or not made a mistake. Oh, yes, you are. No, no, you asked me if I was disappointed. I said, I, I personally am, am disappointed. No, you Israel. believe they made a mistake. I, no, listen, the Israelis voted the way Israelis yeah. voted. Yes, but they made I'm a mistake. Gonna Josh. I, I criticize my, my friends for how they voted or didn't vote. But and you think they're mistaken. Okay, I think anyone who thinks differently than I do yes, is mistaken. Right. No, I, I, but I, I, that's I'm fair. kidding. But, no, but, it's but, not but, fair. But, but, I, but I think, I think that um, as a commentator right now, I live in New York now, uh, looking at it, I think that I would have liked to see a candidate who articulates a vision. I understand. And who could change some of the things that are important to me and to our movement. And so that's, that's Wonderfully what I'm saying. said. Yeah. Wonderfully said. All right, last comment. Well, you'll excuse me if I don't take seriously, uh, as seriously as Josh does, the fact that no one is expressing a vision that would say the things that Josh's movement would like to hear. Uh, I will pick up on one thing Josh said. He said security, 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 and I think that remains the primary interest uh, that oh, yeah. triggers uh, of the vote uh, in Israel. And I think it's totally clear that Israelis, in spite of the fact that Bibi is got under threat of indictment, mm -hmm. and in spite of the fact that people don't really like him much personally, a lot of people, even his biggest supporters, don't like him that much personally. Uh, and in spite of the fact that he's been in office so long that most democracies get tired of people. He came up looking extraordinarily strong in this, whether the final count's going to be 40, 38, or whatever is going to be, probably the person clearly in position to be asked to make the coalition. And, um, you know, I, I uh, had dinner. While, when the decision, which I disapproved of, along with the President's Conference, the American Jewish Committee, and APAC, and others, to bring in the far right, uh, representation in order to secure the coalition was made. I was at a dinner with a very prestigious group of people, including an extremely important journalist, who were all horrified at that decision. And when then people said, well, okay, so who are you going to vote for? And everybody said, he's the most competent person by far to lead us in to the, in the, to the next decade. And he may not have articulated the vision that Josh wants, but he does an extraordinary job of articulating not only the prospects for better relations between Israel and the world, but for what, what's happened under his watch to the Israeli economy, which has really become one of the most powerful and impressive economies uh, in the world and is a huge part of Israel's security. So, The three of you have been fabulous. Thane was fabulous also. I can't thank you enough. This is my thank first you. time having you on, Danielle. Yasha Koch, beautifully done. Thank you. Josh, you are wonderful. I hope you come all the time. <laughs> I love it. And you, my dear friend, beautifully, beautifully said, as always, thank you for making this thank a, you. a priority tonight. Thanks so much for having us. We all enjoyed it. Yeah. I am glad. <laughs> there you have it. Danielle Ziri, New York correspondent for the Daily Israeli Newspaper 
and website, Haaretz, and for Khan, Israel Public Television. Josh Weinberg, Vice President of the URJ for Israel and Reform Judaism and Executive Director of Artsa. Richard Stone, former Chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations. And of course, our thanks to Thane Rosenbaum. We hope you've enjoyed this special live JVS presentation of Israeli Election Night Analysis. And we hope it's given you something to think about and something that in, in some way helps you assimilate all the information and move forward and you have the right to your own opinion. My thanks to JBS's director, Sloan Copeland. Great job, Sloan. JBS's associate director, Dara Gala, production coordinators, Michael Paley and Serge Goldberg. Behind the cameras, Alex Barash and Oleg Aswalenko. In our studio, John McDevitt. On our phones, Ruth Golub, although she didn't get to do much phone work, and to Tisha Bader, who's our fabulous JBS News anchor, and our senior producer, Carol Lilienthal. And I know all of you join me in wishing the very best to the people of Israel on the future of their state. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. <laughs>